You've tried cutting calories, a low-fat diet, and exercise, but you're not losing weight. Reset your fat loss hormones. Dr. Oz has your power plan to break free of the bulge. Plus, Royal Baby Watch. Kate Middleton with another baby on the way. But could severe morning sickness complicate her pregnancy? Coming up next on Dr. Oz. So you get comfortable, let me take you through a little story. So, you want to start losing weight. You try cutting calories. Sound familiar? No luck. You eat a low-fat diet. Nada. Then you try exercise. We all try exercise, but zilch. Why are you not losing weight? Your own hormones could be to blame. Today, the power plan to reset your fat loss hormones and help you lose that stubborn fat that just won't go away. So you enjoy it the way you're supposed to. Joining me is Dr. Natasha Turner, New York Times best-selling author of the Supercharged Hormone Diet. Welcome to the show as always. Thank you, it's so nice to see you. So you argue that it's not just about eating less, it's actually about eating foods that naturally take those fat loss hormones where they need to be. Absolutely, Dr. Oz. I mean, so many people naturally cut their calories when they want to lose weight. I did that, and yet the harder I tried and the harder I exercised and the more calories I cut, the more and more weight I gained, actually up to 25 pounds of, of fat that I gained, regardless of my effort, and here's why. When we cut our calories too much or when we overexercise, it raises the stress hormone cortisol. And cortisol is directly linked to more belly fat, increased cravings for comfort foods, and it actually suppresses your thyroid hormone, which is the master of your metabolic rate. And I had a deficiency of thyroid hormone, so when I overexercise and cut my calories so much, more and more weight packed on. So I really want people to understand that it's not about cutting the calories, but more so thinking about the right foods at at the right times and the right combinations to power up your fat burning hormones. So how can someone find out if they've actually got a hormone issue that's driving the fat gain? <laughs> when I tell you the symptoms of hormonal imbalance, people are always shocked because they think that they're normal. But if you have difficulty getting out of bed, if you feel hungry soon after eating, or if you have cravings, if you have monthly PMS, breast tenderness, irritability, if you feel bloated after a meal, stubborn belly fat, or even fat in your hips and your thighs, these are all symptoms of hormonal imbalance. But what's worse is that they are actually signs that your metabolism is not optimized. So you have to think about restoring the balance of these hormones and then weight loss becomes a wonderful side effect. So I know she's speaking to all of you because you all nodding your heads up and down. Let's yeah. get to Dr. Turner's power plan to reset your fat loss hormones. Take a look at the first step. Your mother told you to eat three square meals a day, but that all-American tradition can put your body on a hormone roller coaster, spiking insulin, the hormone responsible for storing fat after you eat, and plunging it in between meals. The power plan step to keep your fat storing hormone balanced all day long, add a fourth meal. Power plan step number one is to add a fourth meal to reset the hormone responsible for storing fat. So Dr. Turner, you say do away with that old-fashioned issue, you know, idea of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You want us to add a fourth meal. Explain I, that. I do. Um, that whole concept of three square meals a day is antiquated. And, and not only that, it's actually messing with the hormones that make us store more energy as fat. If you wait too long for, with, it, with eating or if you skip meals, that raises cortisol and your blood sugar drops because of that stress. And then that makes you eat more in the following meal. That leads to more sugar in the bloodstream and then you get a great a release of insulin and that always means more belly fat. It's such an important idea. I really want to explain this to everybody. Mm -hmm. So come on over here. Let's say the average number of, of meals you eat in is three, which is what we typically do. Unfortunately, it does something crazy. It creates this environment where you have an impending blood sugar crash that is like a ticking time bomb. So there's fat cells, we all have fat cells. Sometimes they're full, sometimes they're not, but we all have them. Those fat cells have timers on them. So the longer you go between meals, the more likely it is that your body will panic and the timer to the fat cell will go off. When that happens, it sends a very clear message to your brain saying you're starving. When your body senses you're starving, it increases stress to the body. Now, because you've got those stress hormones flying around, your fat cells open wide, they want to take fat and store fat inside because you know what? Who knows when you'll get fed again? The body thinks you're starving, it doesn't want to take any chances, so to lock away that fat in your fat cells for a long, long time. And guess what? When you feel stressed, it will not let go of this. 
So instead, get rid of this, throw that away. We don't want any fat anymore, right? Instead, never let the alarm go off because every time you get close to it going off, you're gonna eat. By adding an extra meal, you reset that timer to a safe spot so the fat cell never opens. You can't get it open to put fat in there even if you want it to. So Dr. Turner, does it matter what time you actually eat those four meals? It absolutely does. Now, many of us are very familiar with the concept of eating every three to four hours, but I think a lot of people don't know you have to eat at the same time every day to lower insulin and optimize fat metabolism. For instance, I eat at 8, 12, 4, and 7 to 8 p.m. Eating regularly stabilizes your insulin and keeps your body fueled like a well-oiled machine. Oh, it sounds good. All right, let's get to the next step to reset our fat loss hormones. Eating starchy carbs sends a shot of the happiness hormone serotonin straight to your brain, causing intense cravings all day long. But if you save your starchy carb for your last meal of the day, you can make that hormone work for you because it also promotes sleep, one of the most efficient fat burning activities you can do. The power plan step to reset and balance your craving hormone, eat one starchy carb after 4 p.m. Power plan step number two is to eat one starchy carb after 4 p.m. to help reset the hormones that burn fat while you sleep. It's a very important step. So explain starchy carbs and why it's so important to get them. Potatoes are a good example of one. But give us an exact idea of what you, quant what you think are starchy. And okay. secondly, what time we ought to be eating them. Well, this is going to ruffle a lot of dieters' feathers because normally people think, oh, I'm going to eat my starchy carbs like bread or pasta or brown rice earlier in the day so I can burn it off. But in fact, I want you to eat those carbs later in the day after four o'clock for two reasons. Number one, you will not set yourself up set yourself up for cravings all day long. And number two, that starchy carb in the evening about the size of your fist or a half a cup stimulates the production of serotonin. It's your happy hormone. It improves your mood, improves your memory, your focus, and it improves your sleep. And when you sleep properly and enough, you will get the release of fat burning hormones. It's one of the best activities you can do. You also say that when we have that starchy meal, let's say it's seven o'clock for our last meal of the day, mm -hmm. we should have a chaser. Yes. You ought to have tomato juice. Now, why is this so important? Well, this makes me think of my grandpa. He had cans of tomato juice always in the house. Oh, good for him. And uh, who knew that he was actually storing less fat after every meal he would drink that tomato juice because the tomato juice blocks the release of the sugar into your bloodstream. So it lowers the glycemic impact of the meal, mm -hmm. and that leads to less insulin release, which always means less fat storage. And why does tomato juice do that? It's because it's acidic. And uh, apple cider vinegar may have the same type of benefit if you consumed it before your meal. Oh, it's a fantastic mm -hmm. tip. All right, yep. so, so you have a starch later That's in the day, right. and then you have your chaser with an acidic uh, uh, beverage like yep. tomato juice, and you take care of some of the fat loss hormones. Let's look at the next step. When you exercise, your body releases a hormone called adiponectin that burns fat and boosts metabolism. The power plan step to reset and boost this hormone that's easier than stepping on a treadmill is when you eat fruit, go blue for blueberries. Power plan step number three, and when you eat fruit, you wanna go blue. Blueberries boost the same fat-burning hormone released during exercise. Big new study on this. How does this hormone help us? This is incredible. Blueberries are the only fruit that are proven to stimulate the release of a hormone called adiponectin. There's a phytonutrient in the skin of the blueberry that stimulates adiponectin, which is the same hormone we get when we exercise that burns fat, lowers insulin, and boosts your metabolism. Um, about a half a cup a day is all that you need. I mean, it's incredible about what your body will do when you give it the right fuel. I looked at studies of obese people. They had a blueberry smoothie every day for six weeks, mm -hmm. and they had a 22% improvement of their insulin metabolism, which means they became better fat-burning machines. So we want you to get the activity as well, Definitely. but this will get you where you need to be in addition. You want Ooh, both of them helping Combining, you it's amazing. Okay, the next step in your power plan to reset your fat loss hormones. When you stop eating for extended periods of time, your body burns up fat and glucose stored in your muscles for energy. But new studies show intermittent fasting, just one day a week, can actually boost the hormone responsible for building muscle. That power plan step to reset the hormone that builds up muscle while burning fat, do a hump day cleanse. All right, power plan step number four is to do a hump day cleanse to boost the hormone responsible for building muscle. Now you say this may not be for everybody. That's right. But to take one day a week, you say maybe, in your case, Wednesdays, yeah. and fast. Yes. And in place of that, you want us to drink lots of other stuff. 
I, I do. I mean, it sounds pretty scary, but it's absolutely not. It's called intermittent fasting, and new studies show it stimulates the release of growth hormone. Growth hormone builds muscle, which is particularly important for women. And remember, we know that muscle is metabolic tissue, so you're going to burn fat better. It involves not eating any solid food for just one day a week, and I want you to drink about four liters of a cleansing tea. Um, I, I brought a collection of different types of herbal teas here. You can mix them together or drink them um, separately. Ginger, green tea, dandelion leaf, hibiscus, juniper, parsley. These are natural diuretics. They help to cleanse your body. Um, if you do need to eat some food, you can have a boiled egg in the morning and you can have some nuts in the afternoon. But besides the teas and maybe an egg or nuts, nothing else. That's right. No fruit drinks, no nothing else. That's right. Right. And why Wednesday? Well, I think you need a couple of days of hormonally balanced eating after the weekend. We tend to cheat, which is also good for our hormones. But maybe do a day or two of clean eating and then do the cleanse day. I think that will set you up better for success. I love these ideas. And I Thank love you, you went back. We, we actually checked through a lot of these concepts. Very, very cool ideas. Mm -hmm. New ways to think about how we yeah. can get those fat loss hormones resettled. I appreciate yeah. it very much. You can find out Dr. Turner's five-step power plan as well as some of her favorite hormone balancing recipes on DrRoz.com. I'll be right back. Coming up next, another royal heir is on the way. Could an acute form of morning sickness complicate Kate Middleton's pregnancy? Just feeling okay, thanks. It's, um, it's, been, uh, it's been a tricky few days. What to expect when you're expecting. Stay tuned. A medical mystery striking down children. Young people healthy one day and then life support the next. A strange new virus. A thousand kids across 10 states infected. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plus, Robin Williams' death. The growing crisis of depression. How to spot the warning signs. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. In the medical spotlight, Kate Middleton's pregnancy. For the second time, Kate is plagued by extreme morning sickness. That's a condition so severe she could be hospitalized, just like she was for Prince George. Elation over news that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are expecting their second child has quickly been replaced with concern that Kate Middleton is once again suffering from hyperemesis gravidarum. Uh, she's feeling okay, thanks. It's, um, it's, been, uh, it's been a tricky few days. Hyperemesis gravidarum is marked by nausea and vomiting so severe and persistent it can require hospitalization, which Kate experienced while pregnant with Prince George. OBGYN Dr. Lauren Stryker is here to discuss Kate Middleton's morning sickness. So Dr. Stryker, what is her problem specifically and how is it different from the sort of garden variety fo problems that folks have? Well, about two thirds of pregnant women have that awful queasy feeling and they might occasionally vomit. But what she has is far more extreme and far more dangerous. Mm. She has a situation called hyperemesis gravidarum, which is only something that maybe one to 2% of pregnant women experience. And not only does she feel incredibly miserable, but she can't keep anything down. So what that means is that she's losing large amounts of weight, she may become very dehydrated, and in fact, sometimes you can even build up these starvation toxins in your body, a condition known as ketosis. So this is very dangerous, and as you said, often will result in a hospitalization so what causes this extreme morning sickness? Well, you know, we know that it has something to do with hormones because hormones are sky high in pregnancy. But clearly every woman has sky high hormones in pregnancy, but not every woman gets this sick. So we do think that there's a genetic component. But interestingly, if we look back hundreds of years ago, there may have been a protective reason why nature did this because before there was refrigeration or modern food handling techniques, it was actually dangerous for women to eat food that might have parasites or microorganisms. And even today, this is nature's way of saying, stay away from coffee and alcohol. Right. I love when there are deep-seated reasons in our genes why these things happen. Yeah. For someone who might be suffering from problems, how do they know if it's severe enough to go to the hospital? Well, look, you know, every, every woman who's pregnant is going to occasionally vomit or is occasionally going to feel queasy. But if someone's not keeping anything down, if they're feeling lightheaded, if they're losing weight, they should call their doctor sooner rather than later because particularly in pregnancy, you can get really sick really fast. And it comes down to an issue of hydration, which we talk about generically on the show, but let me explain pregnancy why it's such a big problem. So let's just say your body tells you that it's thirsty. So you drink a little something, you hydrate yourself, and what does the body do? It begins to use that water. And when you breathe, you lose some, some water. When you, you sweat, for example, urinate, it all comes up. This goes back and forth all day long. That's why we tell you to drink a lot. But 
if we don't replenish what we're losing, or we can't, because in Kate's ca case, she's experiencing severe vomiting, this can't get into her body. Instead, the hydration goes out of her because she's vomiting it out. Her body is left with no fluid inside at all. When that happens, the blood gets thicker, but her blood pressure begins to drop also. So now you get this big, thick, viscous stuff instead of a nice lubricated blood in your body. Your blood pressure drops. Your heart is desperately trying to pump the thick blood. And because the blood pressure is low, it's really have to overwork and it's working as hard as it can and barely, can, barely getting anything into the organs at all. Those trickles are getting in there. When it gets to this point, it would certainly be dangerous to anybody, especially Kate, who has a problem like this, could require intravenous fluids which is what happened, we believe, the first time around. So Dr. Schreker, independent of the mother, what are the dangers to this scenario for the child? Well, it's amazing how well babies do. And in fact, we know that women that have bad warning sickness or even severe hyperemesis like Kate actually have a lower risk of miscarriage than the general population. So as long as you keep the mom okay, the baby's going to be okay. But in an extreme situation, if we go back to the 1800s, Charlotte Bronte, who's the author of Jane Eyre, actually died of okay. hyperemesis because this was before IV fluids and of course the baby was lost as well. No discussion of pregnancy is complete without discussing wives' tales. Yeah. One of the wives' tales is that if you have morning sickness the first time around, it's going to be even worse the next time around. <laughs> well, we know that there is a tendency for someone to have a repeat performance. And in fact, around 20% of women that have severe nausea and vomiting are going to experience it again. But in truth, that number is probably a lot higher because 37% of women that have what Kate has, this hyperemesis gravidarum, they say, done, that's it, only child, and they never go there again. All right, can I ask one more wife's tale question? Sure. Does, does morning sickness predict if it's a boy or a girl? Well, morning sickness often predicts twins, so I'm gonna say one of each. One of each? <laughs> Why not? For the first time, a prediction, one of each. <laughs> one of each. Thank you very much, we'll be right back. Have you ever experienced morning sickness like Kate Middleton? Dr. Oz wants to know, is there a solution that worked for you? I tried flat soda and crackers before getting out of bed. Not the healthiest diet, but it helped me quell the nausea. Share your health stories on Twitter with hashtag OzStory. Next, a salty craving out of control. This is what I call liquid gold. I've also chugged sauerkraut juice. This is where I keep my salt stash. Enslaved by salt. It's causing my blood pressure to go up and down so much. I need a salt intervention fast. Next. It's one of life's greatest mysteries. What really happens when you die? Did you believe heaven was real? I've interviewed people who have come back to life and have described their adventures. Meet the Death Travelers. My heart stopped three times. Before coming back, I encountered a being. Plus, the truth about Omegas. Which do you need? Which can you trust? All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up on Thursday. It's the one thing on almost every dinner table in America. Salt. It makes food taste better, and you need it to be healthy. But if you can't go a day, a meal, even a few hours without eating something salty, you'll relate to Mary's story. I love my salt. I'm a salt addict, plain and simple. I love the way that salt feels on my tongue. Salt just gives everything a zing. It just makes the foods feel alive. Most people have a spice rack. I have a salt cabinet. Regular salt, celery salt, a seasoned salt, coarse sea salt, which is really yummy. Most people like their smoothie in the morning. My thing is a Bloody Mary without the alcohol. This is what I call liquid gold, my pickle juice. Some people may think it's gross, but I love drinking a big, cold jar of pickle juice. I've also chugged sauerkraut juice. It's super, super salty and yummy. I have the same lunch every day at work. This is where I keep my salt stash. I always have to have my chips, I have my salsa, and I have my high sodium soups. I always keep at least one can of my high sodium tomato juice in my purse. It's kind of like my little fix on my way home. I have a lot of friends, they'll say they like to have a nice glass of wine when they get home. I will sneak my bag of chips and eat chips and salsa while um, I'm making dinner. I really realized that I was a salt junkie when I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and found myself standing in front of the refrigerator with this big jar of pickle juice, chugging it down. I've even walked a mile in the dark to get my salt fixed. When I eat too much salt, I get very bloated. I sometimes will have heart palpitations, but it still hasn't stopped me from ODing on salt. 
I've been taking blood pressure medication for over 25 years. I know in my heart that it is my salt cravings causing my blood pressure to go up and down so much. I need a salt intervention fast. I need to get my health back on track. So I've got Mary with me. <laughs> I love the pickle juice story, we'll get back to that. Uh, I wanna help you and everybody else out there who has a salt addiction, mm -hmm. uh, understand why it's not so good for you, but also understand what it's really about, the deeper reasons for it. So I got you in the truth tube to try to understand what that salt might be doing to your body. Okay. All right, so this is just the raw data. First thing, when we see someone with a strong salt addiction, as a physician, first thing I go, uh, go to is hormones. Are they in the right place? Is that the reason why you're craving things? Because your body's out of whack. Yeah. So I checked your hormones out, your adrenals in particular, and they're fine. I didn't find anything abnormal there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Second thing I think about when I have someone who's got a, just a strong desire to have salt is that they might be anemic, mm -hmm. especially iron deficiency anemia. Because you start craving all kinds of things. You'll eat paint if you have iron deficiency anemia. Mm -hmm. I look at your iron levels, they are normal. So is your blood count, by the way. So these are good things. Does that make mm -hmm. you feel a little more comfortable? It does. Okay. It does, yeah. Good. So I'm not finding any of the classic medical reasons why you might be driven. So then mm -hmm. I start thinking about, you know, how much you're really taking in. So I, and I, this is the big concern that I've got. You know, someone who's been on blood pressure medications for 25 years, and there's a direct correlation, which I know you know, between salt and high blood pressure, mm -hmm. there's something else going on here. Uh -huh. So you were kind enough to keep this food journal, this diary for me. Mm -hmm. And the recommended amount of salt... You should all know this. The recommended amount of salt for someone who's on high blood pressure medications or just has high blood pressure, period, is about a half a teaspoon. Right? Wow. Yeah. That's wow. not a bad goal for, frankly, anybody in America who's over the age of 50. It's sort of what we all want to be getting into our lives. Right. Your salt intake in your diary was mm -hmm. 10 times that amount. And those were good days. They were good days? Mm -hmm. You're kidding. No. So, salt's an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. you know, when baby, little babies don't have to have salt in their mouth. They don't get that much salt. You know, mm -hmm. and, this, and something that starts as a, as a desire to have a potato chip eventually evolves into drinking down pickle juice mm -hmm. and makes me think that there's, that there's a deeper intervention I've got to do mm -hmm. to get someone who's smart, insightful, intelligent like you to cope with this. So, I thought I'd go back to the very basics. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to take this long walk from the truth to over to the organ table. I think so. Okay. Ooh, There's I get some, to wear the purple gloves. You get the purple gloves too. This is a more intense experience, I'll say, than, than what we normally do with this. So I'm gonna show you a heart. Mm -hmm. And I want you to appreciate how majestic it is. This is a heart. Notice it's fairly dainty. It's about the size of your mm -hmm. fist normally. Go ahead and hold it. And uh, you know, it's, it's made up of all these wonderful chambers. It's got a very powerful muscle in there. That muscle has to push against the blood pressure every time it beats. When you have prolonged elevation of blood pressure, mm -hmm. even if you're on medications, by the way, this sometimes happens, the heart, which is normally this beautiful, dainty structure, turns to this. Whoa. You see how thick these muscles have gotten? Mm -hmm. This is like a, a muscle-bound bodybuilder. It's gotten so thick and strong because it's continually pounding the blood out. And just put these in one hand and one in the other and just compare the weights you can see how firm and oh. stiff is actually the better word. How would you describe it? I don't know, it's just real thick and fibrous, like it would be hard, like this feels like it's pliable, move, yeah. would move, this just feels like rigid, yeah, almost. It's like rubber. Mm -hmm. Making a heart like this go to a heart like this is something that we don't want to do in life. And blood pressure is the main reason it happens. So now that I've tried very graphically to show you what's happening inside your body. As you try to think back of why you're taking in at least 10 times more salt than recommended, what do you feel? I honestly think it just, just something, just gives me pleasure. It's just as a indulgence for me. It's a self-indulgence, not really thinking about my long-term health, just thinking about what I want at the moment. And wow, this <laughs> really makes me realize that's horrible. Well, the, the good news about the heart is it's a remarkably, remarkably resilient organ. And I want you, every time you think about salt, to think about this. And remember, you can go from this back to this as well. You know, you can actually take a heart that's becoming stiffer mm -hmm. and stop that process. In fact, I bet you, if we can deal with your salt issues, you'll either need a lot less or maybe none of those heart uh, blood pressure medications. That would be wonderful. Right. Would that be an indulgence you'd be willing to participate in? Yes, definitely, definitely. So here's the thing. 
I know we can break this addiction. Mm -hmm. And I know you're not alone, because there are people all over this great land who are mm -hmm. watching us right now with the exact same issues and don't even know they have it. We will break it, but you have to take the first step. Are you willing to, to, to do what I'm asking you to for a couple of weeks to break this addiction? I am, I am all in. And you'll all cheer her on? Uh, when we come back, the plan to break your salt addiction. Stay with us. Coming up, a full plan for Mary to pepper her weakness for salt. This is where we're going to start your fix. A simple approach for every salt addict to tackle their addiction before it's too late. Coming up next. To be part of the Dr. Oz Show audience, go to DrOz.com slash get your show tickets and sign up for a healthy dose of fun. Feel healthy? A medical mystery striking down children. Young people healthy one day and then life support the next. A strange new virus. A thousand kids across 10 states infected. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plus, Robin Williams' death. The growing crisis of depression. How to spot the warning signs. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. Salt is one of the most widely used condiments in the world. But you can have too much of a good thing and become addicted like Mary, who saw some surprising things in the truth tube. Psychologist and food addiction specialist, Dr. Romani Duvasala is here to help Mary and everyone like her break their salt addiction. So how do you know if you just like the taste of salt or if you're truly addicted? You know, one thing to remember is that salt gets lost in the conversation in food addictions. We forget that it's, it's out there and a lot of people have trouble with it. So number one, do you find that you have to have salt as part of every meal, that you always have to have those salty foods? Every meal, every snack, it's always a big part of it. Number two, do you find yourself salting food that's already salted or just automatically, like a habit, picking up that salt shaker all the time? Number three, are you out of control with the salt? So if you can't get the salt, do you feel like you're out of control if it's not in your bag or something like that? And more importantly, once you start eating the salt, you simply can't stop. You eat the whole bag of chips. And finally, you keep eating the salt, you keep consuming the salt, even though a healthcare provider or a doctor has said to you, you need to stop. Mary, I think she pegged you pretty closely. Yeah, I think she did. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thankfully we've got a three-prong approach for every salt addict to tackle their addiction. Let's head on back behind the table. The first step is to eliminate all packaged salts. Why is this so critical? Yeah, I mean, about 80% of the salt or sodium that comes into our diet comes in this way, comes in through the door of the packaged food, the processed food, the pickles, the condiments. And so we're just taking that in. We're not even aware it's happening. And this is where we're gonna start your fix. Where's the, uh, the best way to start? What's the best thing to eliminate? The best way to start is to do it subtly and in a gradual way, Dr. Oz, because as you know, no one's gonna go cold turkey on anything, least of all with salt, okay? So I'm gonna ask you something, mm -hmm. Mary. Are you willing to work with me? And I ask this to everyone here. Are you willing to work with me and give up three, three of your most salty, biggest problem salt foods of the week? Mm -hmm. What would those be for you? Chips. Chips. Pickles. Pickles. And definitely sauerkraut. Okay, chips, pickles, and sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. From this day, mm -hmm. are you willing to make the promise to me that you will drop these three foods from your diet every single day. Doesn't mean you're taking all the salt out. It's gonna find its mm -hmm. way in, trust mm -hmm. me. But can you give those three up? Yes. Okay, yeah. and here's the deal. You're not doing this alone. I am your cheerleader, mm -hmm. and we are gonna work together, because this is about health. This isn't just about salt, this is about your health. And we're gonna work together every single day. And you're gonna have to report back to me every single day that none okay. of this has gone into you. Can you do that? I can do that. I think that's a fantastic you're start. Absolutely I right. really do, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. So, it, is Mary going to have withdrawal signs when she pulls back from these? That's a great question, Dr. Oz, whether you're going to have withdrawal. It's not going to be much like we see in sugar. When people stop eating sugar, they'll report headaches. You're not going to have that kind of physiological withdrawal. But what we see is psychological withdrawal. As I could see, you come home and you go right for the chips and salsa. So now you're going to have to change that habit. And that's the psychological piece. You're going to be sort of like, where's my chips? Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't get to have those anymore. And that's going to be the real withdrawal that 
we see. But again, this is gradual. We're starting by giving up just three. And so it'll be stuck. Mary, pass me the pickle juice. You're not going to need it. I'll take it. Yeah, you're not going to need that anymore. <laughs> right. Next, I want you to add magnesium, calcium, and zinc yes. to every meal. Why are these three nutrients in particular? These are absolutely key because a lot of people who overeat salt, who overdo the sodium, it's often to make up for having a deficit of these three essential minerals. And these are all great things, leafy greens, cheese, you've got over there in the zinc, you've got the cashews. I mean, these are really great foods. Make sure though, if you do the nuts, no salt on the nuts. So don't salt these foods. But these are all wonderful foods. So don't think about this as giving something up, but this is really about bringing all these magnificent, yummy foods into your diet. Great for you and great for your family. We'll put a bunch of recipes with these different foods up on DrRoz.com. Wonderful. And finally, this is a, again, I'm, I'm, I'm into small steps that can make a big difference in your life. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty good example of one. Uh, I want you to rewire your taste buds. And Dr. Romani, can you just walk us through how someone does this in a very elegant way? Absolutely. When you first pull the salt out of your diet, mm -hmm. at first you're going to say, okay, this is a little blander. But before you know, honestly, Mary, we're gonna, in two weeks we're going to be talking again. We're talking every day. But in two weeks we're going to talk mm -hmm. and say, I don't even notice the difference anymore. But I mean, if you really take a look at what you know, Dr. Oz is about to do and put in that shaker, Remember what he told you, how much salt he said, he said you should be having? About a half teaspoon. That's what he just put in that shaker, okay? Mm -hmm. I want you to shake your shaker at this point. I want you to get rid of it. Number one, don't put it on the table when you eat. You don't need to do that. And that is about how much salt that should go into your shaker each day. When that salt's out, there's no more salt on your food. And ideally, again, don't even use a salt shaker. But if you are going to have a shaker, I suggest putting something new in it. And let's start simple with paprika. Okay. I want you to go to the store and pick that up. It gives a really nice zing to your food. It's pretty to look at, prettier <laughs> than salt. And then you can just put that in your shaker. Shake, shake, shake. Get that zing. Get that pow. And then okay. you don't feel like the food is bland. Before you know it, you're not even going to notice that the salt's gone. Great. So Mary, I, I want to follow your story. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be the poster child for this. Mm -hmm. I want everyone else to do the same thing because yeah. you all have you know, salt addicts in your families. Maybe you're one. We'll all do it together. We'll be hearing about Mary's story. Dr. mani has got a wonderful program. She's up on DrRoz.com to help all the salt addicts out there. And you, 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 are you willing to blog about this? Mm -hmm. Great. Right. You'll be honest about it. The I goods will. and the yep. bads, the mm -hmm. curses, the mm -hmm. pickle mm -hmm. juices, I will. everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. You can find the full plan again on DrRoz.com. We'll be right back. Coming up next, they're determined to stop the shame they feel about their size. And in the face of intense hate and judgment, they refuse to back down. A movement to give America what they call a fatitude adjustment. That's next on The Dr. Oz Show. Make your next meal Oz approved. Try a new recipe tonight and see how simple and tasty healthy cooking can be. Visit DrOz.com today. It's one of life's greatest mysteries. What really happens when you die? Did you believe heaven was real? I've interviewed people who have come back to life and have described their adventures. Meet the Death Travelers. My heart stopped three times. Before coming back, I encountered a being. Plus, the truth about Omegas. Which do you need? Which can you trust? All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up on Thursday. Our next guests are determined to stop the shame many overweight people feel about their size. They're making a documentary to give America what they call a fatitude adjustment. And even in the face of intense hate and judgment, they refuse to back down. The images are everywhere. Lean, mean men and women, constantly selling thin as in. But self-proclaimed pop culture junkies, Lindsay Averill and Viri Lieberman aren't buying all the hype. Fat shaming begins when we're young. In our very own fairy tales, we're seeing our heroes as, you know, beautiful and thin and good, and our villains are fat. Thin equals smart and successful, and fat means lazy and lacking power or even evil. Lindsay and Viri felt this fat bias in their own lives. When I was a kid, I was on every diet you've ever heard of. I remember walking down the street when I was 16. There was a car full of teenage boys that drove by and screamed heifer out the window. When I hit my early 20s, and that's really when I gained all of my weight. I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. So they decided to fight back using pop culture as their weapon, making a documentary with a very different point of view. We decided to make a movie that really woke people up to the reality of weight bias, how prevalent it is in the media. 
After decades of consuming what popular culture has to offer, we got tired of the absence of bodily diversity and the all-out hatred against larger bodies. With that in mind, this, this is Fatitude. To raise money for their movie, these budding filmmakers turned to Kickstarter, a website that connects projects with donors. But not everyone was supportive. The hate mail came fast and furious. There were even death threats. We received phone calls at our home. My family was taunted. We were scared. But Lindsay and Veri won't be stopped, mobilizing grassroots support. They are committed to fighting fat prejudice to make their dream a reality. No matter how many threats that we got, all it did was prove that we were striking the nerve on an important topic. That this was something that had to be made, that was necessary to not just educate the people bullying us, but to educate everybody. Filmmakers Viri and Lindsay are here today, and I'm happy to announce they have not only reached the fundraising goal for their documentary, they have surpassed it by thousands of dollars. Congratulations. Yeah. You must feel good about all the positive support. We are so happy. Our, the response, the positive response was exceptional, and we feel like we're going to be able to do what we need to do. If you could take me back to what it was like, the, the, the threats, which was crazy, the, the negative feedback you were getting from doing something that I thought was very noble. Uh, it was really scary. So um, we were, it started online and it seemed sort of just like nasty comments, bullying yeah. that was like playground bullying that I'm old enough to stand and Viri's old enough to stand, right? Um, but then it progressed to phone calls at our home, death threats, rape threats. Oh they were calling our families. They were, I mean, we were really frightened. Yeah, and they were sending pizzas to show us they knew where we lived. I mean, that was why. And whoever was behind it was trying to scare us into hating our bodies and feeling ashamed for being overweight, and it did not work. It's not gonna work. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's so upsetting. Yeah, it, 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 it makes me angry to have people want to celebrate who they are and be taken down for. You know, I read that you used to feel, and I think many of you uh, in your own lives may feel this, uh, Lindsay, that your life was on hold, permanent hold, because of your weight. Yeah, well, you know, I think the culture tells us that we have to hate our bodies, and particularly when they're larger bodies. And, you know, I waited to the very last minute to buy a wedding dress, and I paid a fee to get that wedding dress because I was so afraid of not getting the right size and wanting to be thinner. And, and when I got married, I said to my husband, well, let me just lose a few more pounds, and then we can start trying to have a baby, right? Like, just constantly putting off the things that are totally normal life events, right? Well, what have you learned about yourself through this process? Well, you know, I think that um, for a lot of people, they look at me now and when I'm accepting my body and they think, well, how did she do that? Like, how, that, she must do that every day. It must be a constant struggle. And really, yes, there are days that are better than others, but you have to just make a change. And I think there are three ways that you can go about doing that. So the first one w would be that you need to identify what fat shaming is, which is why we're making this movie, right? You need to get yourself educated that the culture is bias. It is prejudice against fat bodies. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you need to redefine your attitude, right? So you need to start thinking like, not when will I be beautiful enough? When will I be thin enough? But what makes me happy? Sure. How can I be happy, right? And then thirdly, you need to take body positive action, right? So for my example of this is always, I threw away my high school skinny jeans, right? That, that pair of jeans that you're just waiting years to get into. And right. it's, this, it's this token of that body you, you desire, right? This is the body I desire. This is my Hallelujah. body, yeah. right? That's your body. <laughs> Goes against it all. Very advice for others. Yeah, it's advice for others. Uh, I think we need to recognize that everybody's different and different is beautiful. Uh, everyone's body is their own and everyone's body should live free and equally and have love and acceptance in this world. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're all about. I love what you're making out of this, really. I know it's uncomfortable going through it, but it's worth it. A lot of us inadvertently make people feel bad about their size, which often causes them to gain weight. That's what a brand new study backs up. It's something that I think a lot of us have appreciated in our own lives. It's much more important to be proud of who you are than to be thin. It really is. And I want you to both know I'm happy for you, I'm praying for you, I hope it all works out. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. For more of Lindsay Berry's movie, Statitude, wait for next year, because it'll be out then. We'll be right back. Confidence is key to having a healthy mindset. What is your favorite thing about yourself? My attitude, knowing that I can do anything as long as I'm determined. Now it's your turn. Share yours with us on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. 
The hottest free ticket in daytime can be yours by visiting DrOz.com slash get your show tickets. Make your appointment today and join the fun. Is it fun? A medical mystery striking down children. Young people healthy one day and then life support the next. A strange new virus. A thousand kids across 10 states infected. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plus, Robin Williams' death. The growing crisis of depression. How to spot the warning signs. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. A medical mystery striking down children. Young people healthy one day and then life support the next. A strange new virus. A thousand kids across 10 states infected. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Plus, Robin Williams' death. The growing crisis of depression. How to spot the warning signs. All new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. Now it's time for In Case You Missed It. Today we gave you a power plan to reset your fat loss hormones. Natasha Turner joined us. She gave us five steps. You can find them all on DrOz.com. But if you want just one step, this is what I want you to try. Start with this one. Eat one starchy carb after 4 p.m. to reset the hormones that burn fat while you sleep. It's really about saving the starchy carb until later in the day when you're closer to bedtime. So have it for dinner, for example. These are known to raise your serotonin levels. That's the feel-good chemical in our brain, which helps with sleep. And sleep is one of the most important fat-burning activities. You can also try chasing your last meal, especially if it has starchy carbs in it, with a small glass of tomato juice. The acidity from the juice reduces the release of insulin, which helps you avoid storing the carbs you just ate as fat. It's a good one-two punch. Next, take the first step to breaking the salt addiction. Eliminate the biggest source, which is right in front of me. Almost 80% of the salt you take isn't the salt you add. It's already in the food. It comes from processed and prepared foods. So avoid all the processed and prepared foods you can, including condiments, which often have a lot of salt in them. And I was inspired by Lindsay and Viri's mission to give America a fatitude adjustment. I love that phrase, fatitude. It's what we need. It starts with you. Stop the negative body talk today. We are all guilty of pointing at our body and saying, you know, my butt's a little bit big. And, am I true? Right? Yeah. I'm saying the same thing. I wish I had flatter abs. Uh, but it sinks in what you're saying. You listen to those words. They become barbs, and it could actually keep you from losing weight. The latest studies prove that fat shame is actually keeping people from losing weight. Parents know this. I want us all to remember it. So if you hear somebody talking badly about their own body or someone else's, I want you to stop them right then and tell them Dr. Oz said they need a little fatitude adjustment and then embrace their bodies. That's what they ought to be doing anyway. Celebrate who they are. It's the first step, the smallest one, but the first step to bringing healthy back. Now, I want to close with a warning. Please be careful about what you buy online, especially weight loss pills. There are some dubious people online that prey on folks like you who are trying to do the right thing for your own health. Sometimes they even try to make it seem like I'm endorsing their products. I don't. To see a full list of our trusted sponsorship partners, you can go to DrOz.com. I'll see you next time.